about 7 kilometers beyond Palavaram at and around the Grand Southern Trunk Road which links Madras to the south of Tamil Nadu lies the bustling locality of Tambaram. Tambaram is in many ways the southern gateway to the city. It hosts the sprawling campus of the Madras Christian College, the Air Force Station and a major bus depot. Above all, Tambaram is the city's third railway terminal from where nearly 300 suburban trains operate, daily commuting a few hundred thousand people to work and back. We were welcomed into the home of Noel and Linda Fuller, the only Anglo-Indian family until recently resident at the railway quarters of Tambaram, and were treated to a lovely meal of peas rice and pork vindalu. In those days, the, the quarters, we didn't have any electricity. So we used to have the uh, hurricane lamps. We used to light the, the lamps in the evening after six o'clock when it became dark. And also we had the, the dry latrines. It used to be called the thunder boxes. And, and that was converted in the late 60s, I think over 68 or 69, the entire quarters was done away with that manual scavenging. Noel was born in the quarters and has strong memories of childhood. As children, uh, we used to have uh, play marbles and this gilly dande and then this old cycle rims. We, we, we used to call it the bandies. So we used to climb, we used to climb up the trees and uh, tie the swings and rock the mangoes and have this uh, catapults and uh, hit the blood sectors. We used to call them buffs. And the unwritten rule was, you'll be back home before the lights, the, the, the kerosene lamp is lit in the evening. Yeah, yes, yes, those golden days are really golden days. All the railway children used to get together and used to play the seven stones and uh, uh, this um, hitting with beans, you know, the bean bags, like that. So, and we were all brought up very unitedly. I lived in a colony, railway colony, you know. We had nice fun. Here to the children, but when I came here, these children were quite big. But times have changed, not like our fun. Our fun was clean fun. So every railway colony had a railway institute, and likewise, Tam Pramoja had a railway institute, and uh, people really had a. a I think the institute is good standing. standing no? It's just standing, it's standing, but, but no more other dances yeah. there. No more other dances uh, being allowed. Only marriages, of course, uh, for the employees who work there. And uh, if anybody recommends them, yes. But dances are no more. We used to have the Christmas dance, we, had the US, we used to have the New Year's dance. Noel's lineage on the railways is extraordinary. My great grandfather father, John Edward Fuller, when he got married in St. Mary's Church in Arbidian Street on, on 3rd of October, I think 1862, at the age of 25, his profession was listed as a driver in the Madras Railway Company. And after that, then his son, Albert James Fuller, then John Burton Fuller, then Patrick Fuller, and then I. And when we look at the family history, we find that we are basically a generation of railway men. Reservation for Anglo-Indians in the railways, customs, post and telegraphs, and other sectors were discontinued in India since 1960 and many families hit upon hard times. There was not much of emphasis placed upon education because they knew even if you're just a standard boy you'll get a job in the railways and in the postal telegraphs and the harbors. But after the reservation lapsed then we found ourselves marooned in an island without a paddle. You had other Anglo-Indians working with you? Do you Many Anglo-Indians working with you, yes. In those days we had a protection. If they had 10 vacancies, four were reserved for Anglo-Indians. And I was, lucky, I was a luck, one of the lucky ones. Okay, you, yes, because you must have been one of the last ones to avail of this benefit in the sense that by so. 1960s they were all taken away. I think so, yes. I think uh, about 60, I think they stopped it, yeah. In the 60s, they allowed it to be wasted out. And when I asked Anthony this question, he beautifully said, he said, Professor, we cannot write piggyback on this anymore. 
our, our people need to grow out of this, get more educated. Otherwise, they're going to just confine themselves without much uh, growth. There's a higher and fire in private service. In government, it is not there. So I would like our Anglo Indian people to come back to railways. I am fighting for reservation. We had 4%, 5% reservation between 50 and 60. We lost it. Now we are fighting with the government to give us at least 1%. So that we can see a flow of Anglo Indians into the railway. Gone were the days like after high school we can get into the railways anywhere. But that didn't happen. Soon that all, you know, was over. So they had to, should have a degree and all that, which was compulsory. So that's, we had to encourage our children. But and I think on the whole, like our community has come a long way regarding education. Now the Anglo Indians, I feel, are conscious that they just can't get jobs like that, they have to work for it. And many of them are going in for higher studies, which I'm really very proud and happy of. This never happened before in before, your time? Before, very few. In my time, a few went to college, not all. Why, why they did they not study? Because they knew that, you know, they could get into the railways, they could get into the postal telegraphs, they could get in, they get gov good government jobs. So they just, they, high school, passed the high school, that was enough for them. There was a time when you need not be a graduate, but as an Anglo Indian, you'll get a lot of jobs. But I think I was at that crucial thing where you have to be a graduate. So I educated myself. I did my master's in, in public administration, and that really, really helped me. And that's why we got my children also made them to complete their degree. As for Noel Fuller, his two sons are doing well for themselves. One is a marine engineer, while the other is a lieutenant in the Indian Army. Indeed, Anglo-Indians continue to join the armed forces today, doing the community proud. We spoke to the mother of Major Lionel Wilkins, who is with the Armoured Corps. And how does he look at the profession? Very good, especially for Anglo-Indians. They're looked up at in the Army. So, oh, you're an Anglo-Indian, very nice. Some of the senior officers worked under anglo Indian officers who were really very good. Yeah, my first posting was in Punjab. So that was a very nice posting. People were very hospitable. Then from Punjab I came right into Sikkim where I stayed for three years. Then I came to Bakrakot, that's near Benaguri in the east. From there I'd gone to Arunachal, Leh, Ladakh, Kargil. Then I'd come back to School of Artillery as well as in Hyderabad as Colonel Training. I have also had a nice tenure in the NCC when I was the colonel training for two years with more than two lakh students for the whole of Tamil Nadu. That's great. Kargil is what interests us because it was a period of great tension across yeah. the border. And how was it like to be in the thick of things? Kargil is a chicken neck. If the Pakistan people had to take Kargil, then the whole of beautiful place Ladakh and Leh would have been taken over. And you were at war. How did you feel on the ground? Yeah, very, we were very confident because our guns were firing. We got a lot of confidence in the guns. The guns never tell a lie. And we know that when once these guns fire, the Bofors, it pulverizes the bunkers of the Pakistan people. They had no alternative but to run away. Anglo-Indian contribution to defense in India goes back to several decades before independence. Many won Victoria Crosses for their bravery during the First World War, their nationality often cited by the imperial government as British. Anglo-Indian participation in the Second World War was also sizable, certainly over 7,000 in number, with many serving in British regiments. Some of them were sent to Mesopotamia, Turkey and Persia. Barbara Clare remembers her dad being stationed at Egypt with the Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers during World War II. My dad was in the military, of, uh, in the British Army. They had their own property originally, then he joined up and he went to the Middle East. So we also moved to Wellington. We were in Wellington barracks for a long time. Another person who was with the REME and had won the Star of Africa Award was Morris Watts of St. Thomas Mount. He was part of the renowned 8th Army, which played a key role in the Allies winning the battle for Tobruk in Libya. Post-independence, Anglo-Indians served in the Indian Armed Services and many distinguished themselves in both the 1965 and the 1971 wars. In service, we had excellent uh, colleagues, a uh, friend of mine, uh, John Waits, his father was General Waits. We served in the war together 
Johnny left and became a very senior executive in, in Nigeria. Which war was this? Uh, this was in 1965. <coughs> then after that, of course, in 1965 was the time when the Anglo-Indians really excelled in all three services, winning many, many gallantry awards, the Keeler Brothers, uh, uh, Pete Wilson, uh, Mally Mullen, uh, there were so many of them. And then, of course, among the army, Desmond Haight was the most uh, famous of them. And in fact, uh, a well-known statistic is the fact that on a proportionate basis, given the number of Anglo-Indian officers who were in the armed forces, Anglo-Indians won the highest number of gallantry awards in 1965 and 1971. See, in, in the 1962 and the 1965, the 1962 uh, war on India by China and then the 65 war on India by Pakistan, many of the Anglo-Indian soldiers did extremely well. And at that time, Australia was at war in Vietnam. And many Anglo-Indians thought that Australia, at that time, Australia was only recruiting Anglo-Indians. No other community from India. Into the different yeah. services? No, no. Into the country. country. Okay. And many Anglo-Indians got suspicious as to why only Anglo-Indians were, you know, allowed to come in. Whether, it, whether to join the services. Because at that time, Australia had compul compulsory uh, military uh, yeah, service. Yes, service. So was this fear true, Joe? Or? No, no, it was not true. It was not true. They were able to communicate to youngsters who had no idea about the armed forces. So these people, Peter Brothers, were able to... And there was another gentleman by name Jeffrey Hill. Uh, when I saw him in 63, we also went, I also went for the Air Force selection. I was not selected, he was selected. He became a fighter pilot. I met later some very senior officials, air marshals and air vice marshals, because some of my relations are there in that rank. They mentioned that Jeffrey Hill has excelled very well as a pilot and later emigrated to Australia. Tell us something about Trevor Keeler at Bandogra. <coughs> Trevor was very, very uh, encouraging as far as sports were concerned, particularly hockey. He was a great hockey fan and every match that we played, every match, whichever team was playing, he would be there to encourage, to you know, facilitate us and it was really good. And at that time, I think he was a wing commander, if I'm not mistaken, you know, it would have been 1971-72. Okay, and how about MSD Wallen? Oh, another gem. <laughs> Oh yes, he, he was a great man. I, I, I could not have had a better commanding officer. And to think that he was my first commanding officer, it was uh, immensely satisfying because there was nothing that, you know, he, he looked at things not in that military discipline type. It was, he had a human touch to everything. And that was what, you know, separated him from the other officers. He wouldn't... Uh, you know, I'll give you an example if you don't mind. Okay? You know, there was a, a guy who was a boxing coach, and uh, he got, I don't know, he got a bit, uh, you know, over the top, and he went up to his commanding, he was in the helicopter squ squadron, he went up to his commanding officer and wanted to beat him and so on. So he was put on charge and taken to MST Woolen. When he, MST Woolen was to, trial is his charge sheet. He just took off his ranks, put it aside and told this fellow, look, I'm also a boxer. Now, let me see what you can do. You want to box, isn't it? Come on, we'll box. And of course, needless to say, this fellow was shivering because he was group captain. Then he started explaining the story, you know. And the guy had a genuine problem. So, MSD, you know, uh, didn't punish him, gave him a severe warning and uh, told him never to repeat what he did. So, that was the kind of person Malcolm was. He was immensely uh, human in 
nature. And uh, he reached out to all of us. And we simply loved him. We adored him like, you know. He was such a good man. So that was uh, my first commanding officer. And the last man also was, uh, he helped me a lot in retaining me in a Hakim pet till I actually got out of the Air Force. And that was Tully. Sure, Tully, yes. It was uh, my first job actually in 1977. And uh, I started working before we started the business in 86 in Fox and Kings. And one of my colleagues there, the travel manager, was Trevor Keeler. And uh, anyway, oh God, we had so much fun. And you know, Trevor, I used to go to his house, he used to come to our house and with the family. So here the interaction with the Anglo-Indian community was great. My secretary was a, uh, I had a secretary, I had become a manager in Cox and King. He was a, a, a newly married, uh, uh, she was Anglo-Indian, Carmen, Carmen McGee. So great, great people you can make out. I mean, there's nothing about it. You know, you could say, ah, this community, it's got flaws, you know. Nobody can say that. Us Punjabis, 1,000 flaws, one good thing. You know, Haryanas, 1,000 flaws, one good things. So that way, this it's like the Parsi community in some way, if I may again make a, a comparison. Of course, the difference here is that the Parsis are more, has, have been business oriented, you know, and the Anglo-Indian community has not. Our commanding officer used to mention about Colonel Charles Kampagnak. Charles Kampagnik was supposed to be a very, very tough person. He refused to accept a wrong order because he felt it would jeopardize the safety of uh, people under his command. Colonel Charles Kampagnik of the 3rd Gurkha Rifles distinguished himself in the 1965 war. He was one of those who had been extricated from Burma during the Japanese invasion. Many Anglo-Indian families or Anglo-Burmans who were posted in the military or the railways at Rangoon and other places had heart-rending tales of trekking for days through the jungles to reach India. Quite a few did not make it. Mother was orphaned uh, uh, probably due to a Japanese air raid and she and her elder sister uh, together with an aunt and a cousin uh, literally trekked their way through the jungle of death and um, um, the stories that she told uh, were, uh, were um, uh, you know, to this day uh, moved me. There were times when they had to lick the dew off leaves uh, to, to get water and they were so hungry at times that they chewed on leather belts just to um, have something to, uh, to, to try and eat and so they uh, fortunately uh, reach the uh, Indian border um, and then uh, she was she was literally skin and bone um, and uh, then we're taken into uh, India and um, she was brought up uh, quite often uh, by nuns in various convents uh, in the north of India. We had a word with Trevor Macher who did honorary work with the ex-servicemen's association located on the FINS campus. The president also was an Anglo-Indian. He yeah. died. Yeah. He died. Commodore Claudius. He died after several years and then Colonel um, Menon took over. But the work was, he left work mainly to me. So I did all the, I, I started a Christmas party for all the beneficiaries. There were many Anglo-Indian beneficiaries? Many Anglo-Indians. Mostly for the Anglo-Indians who okay. served in the war. You're talking about the Second World Second War? Second World War, yeah. There are still people yeah. receiving? Uh, yes, they are still receiving. The widows are paid only rupees 1,500 per month, which is a pittance. So you got only from the British government? What was the Indian only government? Only nothing from the Indian government. They didn't recognize us at all. In fact, the whole Madras Gaz was Anglo-Indians. Uh, some of them left the Madras and joined the British regiments. So they went abroad. So that's where a number of them uh, got awards. Where? Brought me to, where did they They go? went to Burma. Okay. Went to Burma and a few went to the Middle East. Established in 1857-58, 
The Madras Guards was the oldest volunteer force in India, consisting mostly of Anglo-Indian men. Likewise, the Women's Auxiliary Corps of India, which functioned during World War II, comprised predominantly of Anglo-Indian women. A few worked in the Women's Royal Indian Naval Service. When they wear a tunic, they look as smart, if not better, than the, their counterpart, the, their men. Very smart, they're as tough, some of them are very good in their physical prowess and they excel. They say they are more balanced than the men. Uh, home conditions were so bad because the families were so, so huge that my mom and dad couldn't afford to send me to college. So by constraint, I had to join, start working, so I joined the Air Force. Michael worked for 17 years in the Indian Air Force before joining Air India. He gives great credit to the training in the Air Force. It taught me a lot of things, you know, uh, your social habits, your behavior, everything. It, I could say it just molds a person into being a, a perfect human being. I asked him if his colleagues knew that he was an Anglo-Indian. Yes, yes, very much. They, as a matter of fact, many of them would call me Gora. Gora means white. white. And uh, some people in the North India would call me Angres. English. And uh, when, when I tell them that my mother tongue is English, they laugh at me. They say, how can you say your mother tongue is English? So like that. But I got along very well with all. Uh, I, I traveled, like I told you, you know, to Assam, to uh, Punjab. And then besides that, I did some trainings in Gorakhpur, Kanpur, Allahabad. I went to, you know, on to these places to play games and so on and uh, mixed with a lot of uh, local people from that area and I absolutely enjoyed it. India is a fantastic country really. We also met an ex-serviceman in Tambaram. I was born and brought up at Vilupuram, studied in Sekhara Convent, then moved to Campion High School, 9th, 10th and 11th at Campion. In the year 1971, July, I joined the Air Force. I served in the Air Force for 21 years and came out as a warrant officer in the Flight Gunners branch. He has seen service in many parts of India. That's a gypsy life because the, as a defense person, you, you always have, have to have a box ready, packed to move wherever the high command orders you to go. Bernard later moved to the State Bank of India and after retirement has been treasurer of the Palavram branch of the All India Anglo Indian Association. In 1969, I was the hot choice for the presidentship of Sir Thomas Anglo Indian Association. But I was so unsettled, I couldn't take it. That, that time you were staying here in Palav? No, no. I, I was shunting for Tambra. Tambra is my headquarters because uh, my father came to Tambra in 1940. Then in 1940. From where did he come? From Willapur. As for Bernard, his son is a doctor at the Hindu Mission Hospital in Tambaram. Uh, I had uh, gone to Ukraine. I did my MBBS over there. I completed in 2010. And from then I've been practicing medicine. You must be getting around uh, a um, number of patients. Yeah, number of patients. Uh, in patients itself will be around 100, 100 plus always in this hospital. Uh, it's a very busy hospital, Hindu Mission. And, um, uh, patients we have from uh, normal infectious patients, surgical patients and even uh, oncology that is cancer patient also we deal. Do you also have trauma care? Yes, we have emergency trauma care which is 24 hours. Uh, we have uh, doctors on call, all the major consultants are on call. How does one make one's child succeed in life? I put my son into the boarding. So he was in the boarding from 1st to 12th. But when he had come home for holidays, every year for those 12 years, morning he had to go for his basketball then he would come home uh, even if I went to work he had to study what he had to study something and of course afternoon a little rest and then evening again he would go for a game then again come back and his science and maths was always the language which is very difficult for our kids so language science and maths to a great extent you come to learn you know how to look after yourself. Whether it has to polish your shoes or get your uniform ready, 
get up in the morning, go to the study hall, and then do your studies, your homework. There's no, uh, you know, pampering or anything. But you can't bend at seven. You can't bend at seventy. It's advice to the Anglo parents is that from the day one they are born, we should have to trim them or mold them in other way. And we have to be at the back of children. It's not that the children will do everything by themselves. No. They are, our Anglo-Indian children, as, as people say, are likely to go astray because of the influences, exposures, TV and cell and all this. Thing. So we as a parent, we have to put them on the right path. I asked Bernard if he liked Tambaram. In a way, yes, living is cheap, people are good, and uh, there's no hustle bustle of the city city life. So I'm very happy with Tambaram. I've, I've taken root here, so... Uh, many other Angolans on camp road? There are plenty. Mr. Jones is here, Mr. De Cruz is here, Fernandez is there. We have one, uh, even on pilot, Ms. Eslin Dakota was a group captain in the Air Force and then left the Air Force after he, he served a few years and, he, and now he's a, he's a captain in the Jet Airways. Opposite the railway quarters in Thambaram is Ganapatipuram where a number of anglo indian families once resided. Around the church people stayed. So there was Ganapatipuram place there. Okay, and there a lot of anglo stayed there, especially we had, you know, uh, the Suarez's, we had the McKevins there, we had the Rodericks, then we had the Smiths, okay, and many more of the families. You know, these are all big, big families who stayed there. Okay, the, we had the Knights also. Knights. So these are the families who stayed in Ganapatipuram. Okay. I asked Justin about his association with St. Fatima's Church. You no, know, I had another passion of, you know, serving God also. That, that brought me to the church. You know, so, in, in fact, you leave the choir? Yes, I leave the choir in, in Fatima Church for the past 25 years. So I'm there as a choir master. I, I stepped into the choir at the age of 19. Now I'm 50, 51. And that is just opposite the Christian College. And there also, there were lots of Anglo-Indians. Rodericks is right there and uh, Samson's were there, the Lopez's, Archers, so many. In fact, the Smith colony nearby was so named after a family of Anglo-Indians who once occupied most of the houses there. Now it's known as Smith Lane because that entire right hand side, if you go on the road, right and left, they're all owned by Anglo-Indians. Uh, in the mid 80s, they thought, you know, it might not, the scope might not be good for them here. So what happened, they did sell the houses for a little of nothing, not much did they get, and they moved to Australia, to England, in different parts. In the 80s, in the 80s, yeah, mid 80s. So these were independent houses? Independent houses. Independent houses, you know, like the old houses you see anywhere, like in Royperum, in, uh, in Washington Pet, and uh, St. Thomas Mount, like. In this colony, only a couple of families remain today though there are other families in the surrounding areas, such as the Hurleys, the Meketishes, the Christensens, the Filberts, the Santaniers, the De Silvers, and the Pereiras. Long-standing families of Tambaram, like those of Neville Narsis, Ivan Rodericks, Peter Daniels, Chico and Yvonne Johnson, Brian and Hazel Briggs, and Cordoza, and the De Cruzes, and the Bothwicks have moved on. In this particular locality, Still, there are a lot of Anglo Indians. Yes. And uh, this particular Smith's colony, Ganatatipura, Maha, Mahalakshmi Nagar, this area that you just came through, was fully dominated by Anglos. Yes. Everybody, I mean, all the Anglo Indians, most of them, all the quarters people, once the retired uh, retirement was given to them, they took houses beside each other because they were all born, brought up here, and you know, they're used to this particular, you know, uh, moving about here only studying in Christ King School, going to college, Madras Christian College. So like this area became very familiar to them. So they didn't want to move out unless and only if they were moving out of the country. Andrea is adept at making wedding decorations and bridal accessories and is a popular Christian wedding planner in the city. Another popular wedding decorator has been this man who stays opposite the Railway Institute in Perambo. Putting it up is the most pleasing part when you deal with the client. If you're not there, it's like a decorator knows better what will look good there, at what height, what lighting, what is necessary. Oh, so you coordinate the lighting effects yes, also? Yes, yes, yes. 
It's the lighting that brings life into it. So now you're full time into decoration work? Yes, yes, very much. Does it fetch you enough money? Ah, I wouldn't say enough. Just about to make ends meet. You can buy a grog and green, sir. <laughs> I can buy my grub. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not interested in grog anymore. <laughs> take, you the, take you to the grave. Joe trained in interiors and exteriors at the School of Design on Mount Road and had a fondness for engineering drawings. He is passionate about his art. See, it's only the fluency of the hand, no? If the writing is perfect, then that, that leads to art. Every line has a meaning to it. So how did the art progress, I ask? Mostly the portraits, then science drawings, then engineering drawings. That's how it grows. As for Andrea, she recalls her earlier years of employment at prominent ad agencies. I was working for McCann Erickson. So that's an advertising company. I was working where, again, anglo Indian boys were involved. There were a lot of anglo Indian boys. Jeffrey James. And uh, Leon from St. Thomas Mount. You must be knowing Leon. Leon right? Island. Yeah. All of, all of us are colleagues. Brian, Thomas. All of us work together. We, we are all colleagues. So, again, Martin O'Brien from Hindustan Thompson. He's from Perinbo. He was working with me in Hindustan Thompson. Her mother, who worked for the Madras Port Trust for over 30 years, is very fond of Tambaram. Very good food we used to get there. We never used to get any adulteration. We used to get it from the uh, market from this uh, Gudwan Cherry. That's why they used to have fresh vegetables that used to come to Tamram market. All the people from Pallavram and Krompit used to come to Tamram to buy their vegetables. Her husband Roy has been a music teacher and Andrea herself had occasionally sung for a band or two. I used to sing for the band. I used to sing for, uh, you must be known as Stephen Jacob, Paul Jacob's brother. They had a band. I used to sing just like that, for fun, not as a profession. Indeed, in former times, almost every Anglo-Indian locality had its own band for Western music. Palavaram had the Moonstones and the Scarlet Sensations. Wepri had the Blue Velvets. St. Thomas Mount had the Mudskippers. Eno had the High Tensions. And Perimbo had the jumping jewels, the flames, the fabulous pearls, and so on. When I uh, finished college, I got an opportunity to actually get into music uh, with a friend of mine called Gerard Costa. We wanted to form a band. So uh, we met three very young musicians, all three Anglo Indians, who were at least around uh, seven to eight years junior to me. One is Paul Jacob, the other is Don and Murray, and the third is Roger Lazaro. In those days, we used to attempt complicated music like Spiral Chaira and uh, Steely Dad and stuff like that. So uh, we had formed this band called uh, Holy Smoke, uh, just to you know make it sound a little offbeat. Anglo-Indian musicians and bands played at the movies in the early days, at hotels and at weddings. Until the late 80s, there were a plethora of Anglo-Indian bands in the city, not easily forgettable. The fabulous ones, the shades, the psychedelics. Wild Angels, the Human Bondage, the Shadows, the Blue Velvets, the Heartbeats, the Heritage, the Renditions, the Images, uh, the Cool Cats, uh, the Black Sheep, and the Airways. These were what I remember. I used to sing uh, in a band before. We used to be a six piece band, and I used to be the crooner. We used to sing in some of the major hotels in Chennai. And uh, most of all, we used to sing for the Anglo-Indian weddings. They used to have us sing for their weddings. And uh, we used to sing major old rock and roll style, bluegrass style. And uh, I used to also sing pop. And uh, I think that's how even uh, singing became a passion for me. I play rhythm now. So we've got our own band, which is called the uh, Country Imitations. And so I've got Marlon Gomes playing lead. Yes, but I managed to manage. Yeah. What is it about country music that uh, is so special to country you? Country is in our blood. I mean, if you look at any anglo Indian community, we all talk about country music and country music is what's got us going every day. Who's your favorite country music singer? Vince Gill. Andrea's brother was part of a band from Mount. And then we had Ferdinand, uh, Ferdinand Lafogue. 
Lafayette. From yes. Gindi. From Gindi. Mm. He was the uh, guitar. He was a bass guitar. Then my husband was uh, Gerard was the rhythm yeah. guitar. My brother was the lead guitarist. And the crooner was uh, Erin. <laughs> yes, Erin and uh, and Wayne Wayne Anderson. Yes. So that was their group. That was their band which they had set up. We used to have a band in those days called um, uh, Bluegrass. The name of the band itself was Bluegrass. I remember singing with Gregory Richards in Island in the Stream. I mean, we are constantly booked for weddings in Mount, which of course Alan used to be the MC, so he would recommend our group. And, uh, and also we happened to play in Madras Club, which is not so easy to get into playing in Madras Club, because they want the oldies and that kind of music and the country music, country and western band for weddings was uh, Mario, Mario De Cruz on bass guitar. I used to play the keyboard, Kerwin on guitar, and uh, Dennis Thomas on drums. That was the initial Mudskippers. Of course, the band kept changing later on with different musicians. We went around, went about for, went strong for about five years. Ago. And then, yeah, all of us had to go our ways. And... But what made them begin in the first place? Kerwin and me used to go watch all the other bands, uh, Gavin's, Gavin Roderick's band and uh, Sean Roberts and Neil Roberts. We used, we used to go watch them when we were young. So we said, okay, let's, let's start a band. We played at weddings? Yes, predominantly a lot of Mount weddings actually. A lot of Mount weddings, Perumbo weddings and Trichy weddings. So that means this takes a lot of your time. Your whole life is dedicated to music. This is my life now. <laughs> so this is your home life and then there's work life and yeah, that's, that's work. Music is work now. And having said that, we were not so familiar with country music. And one of our good friends who was getting married in uh, Calicut gave us the first cassette of country music. We had no idea of country music. We were following what was then the trend. Michael Jackson was a big uh, you know, hero for me and then it went to zero, that's different. <laughs> okay. But, uh, but his music class in class goes on. Simon Garfunkel. A little old for my time, but I love harmony, and that's one of the reasons why I'm with the choir. So anything with harmony, including way back Everly Brothers and stuff, you know. So that, that, that's music is there, and it's it's been a part of life every single day. I don't remember a day without music. So indeed, music has been the lifeblood of the community. <laughs> I love music. I'm teaching my daughter to be a pianist and my son to be a drummer. And uh, I grew up with my dad's record collection. That's the earliest memories I have of him playing his records on his uh, on his turntable. And uh, till date, I, uh, I have a turntable and I listen to my records. Uh, it's what gives me a lot of peace of mind and you know calm. And uh, I'm I'm a crazy uh, live music fan, so I keep going for all kinds of concerts and. We asked Blossom about music and dance in her time. I used to go for dances. <laughs> I used to go for more dance. And then at uh, St. Thomas Mount, we used to go then. My husband had a lot of records, different names, 33, the 45, and the other 78. All these records and different um, uh, singers, uh, Jim Reeves, J Johnny Cash, and we all had all country singers because he loves country songs. I like 
like old music and like my still like my Frank Sinatra and all that. <laughs> oh, okay. And singers? Uh, and any other singers? And now I like the, the, the Sam Smith, I like very much. I like Ed Sheridan very much. Okay, you have a generation. That's nice. Who's your favorite singer? Remember? You're fond of country, obviously. It's changed over the, over the years. So. And, and now, uh, as I get older, I'm, I'm into country, country rock. No. I love country music and uh, I like knowing the backstories of singers and what they did and I do all of that and I read up read up their autobiographies and I look at any movies that have been done on their life. For example, Loretta Lynn and, and uh, Crystal Gale, I didn't know that they were singers, uh, they were sisters, sorry. And though they've changed their stage name sort of, but they were actually from the same family. So stuff like that and I like uh, uh, watching autobiographies and other stories written about country singers. So you must have seen Johnny Cash's movie. That of course, yes. Johnny Cash, yeah, of course, Walk the Line. Owen oh, wants to know if you know Josh Turner, whether you like Josh Turner. Josh Turner, country uh, music guy? I'm not into country music. <laughs> and my family hated me for that, but I'm more a Pink Floyd Queen kind of guy, so... <laughs> There's this artist called Mahalia. She's like still a little underground but she's someone who I really like. She writes her songs and she sings and I mean it's soulful, it's different, it's more relaxed and someone a little more calm than like really heavy so like there's this artist called FKJ so he's really good as well and there's Anderson Park who's one of my favorites so no music it's a little di different but I love I, like country music as well. So. A lot of a lot of new new country, uh, I wouldn't even classify, put them in the genre of country country music. Guys like Keith Urban, and the youngsters, yes, they, they go crazy with these guys. But Carrie, Carrie Underwood. Carrie Underwood, no way I'd classify her. Taylor Swift, I wouldn't put her in the country genre, but they're making money, so good luck to them. That's. So who yeah, is your, who's your all-time favorite country singer? I don't have any favorites. So I like guys with, with good masculine voices. Yeah. Don Williams, and Merle Haggard. Yeah, that, that was old, old country. Now I listen to guys like Travis Tritt and Leroy Parnell. Yeah. And many, many wouldn't have probably heard of these guys, but uh, they're good country singers. But when you go, when you slam the door, I think you know. nowadays but um, the kids are picking up and asking to listen to music so we started you know playing some music for them uh, they're getting to dance and just it's better than watching TV so we try to encourage them to listen to more music. But What's the type of music do you like? I could listen to anything but country is my favorite and of course jazz and R&B love listening to it After rock and roll you never you never get tired of rock and roll it's always there it keeps you keeps your feet tapping so and keeps you moving so yeah. I'm a rocker, a rock and roller. Oh rock. rock. <laughs> Elvis and CCR these are all my favorite uh, singers. Not the current uh, boom boom I don't like all that.
school, I had many friends and your kids, but some notable ones, particularly from La Martini, you know, Cliff Richard, was then Harry Webb. He used to come to Delhi and sing, and we didn't know much till much later when the Beatles and everybody became famous that Cliff Richard was actually the Harry Webb we knew who used to come from Lucknow. His father had the eight wheeler, you know, between Lucknow and Kanpur, they had the. And then Tony Brent used to sing in Volga. And Tony Brent, of course, became famous. And of course, in Chennai, you had the uh, Engelbert Humperdinck. Do you like Engelbert? Childhood yeah, favorite. Yeah, which, which number? Love me with all of your heart. So there was Engelbert, of course, and um, him being from Madras was uh, quite fascinated me, though he's played down his Anglonian roots a bit. But it was interesting reading about him and 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 his journey and it's and his voice, of course, is legendary. So that was, then, of course, there's Cliff Richard. We interacted with Wayne Filbert, a young keyboard player and a former student leader at the Madras Christian College. My college works up from 1.45 to 6.15, so I save up money, I play in the band with daddy. So whatever money I get from that, I educate myself, I mean I go, I enroll myself in the CSE course, it's computer. Uh, basically when I was in St. Deeds, I was like an average level student, but then that gave me a base, it put me up to come up on stage and then take part in debates. Now in the college, I was the MC for the recent thing which happened in Insignia. I only conducted the overall thing. Yeah, MCC at that time was, you know, everything was there. The ragging was there, the gutters, the boxing ring, you know, music, people with guitars walking around the back of the cafeteria playing jamming music. Yeah, those were the days. And of course, each one was associated with a different hall. Yeah, I was associated to Thomas's hall. Yeah. When I went to college, when I started, went to college in uh, Madras Christian College, so I, I never told anybody I need to play keyboard, I just said I need to play bass. So, so I just started playing bass there in college with the bands and got to play different styles of music over the years. And you must have played at Woodstock. Yeah, which is I think called Sarang now. It used to be called Mardi Gras back in the day, I think. Any fond memories of the college? Were there any other Anglican friends in your department? There was this one friend actually, Daniel De Monte, from uh, from Czech Belt, yeah. But he was my senior. But we used to play together in the band, so. Oh, okay. Yeah, Daniel De Monte. Okay, but it was very really difficult to come across a fellow Anglo. Madras Christian College had didn't have many Anglo's. They were like all the Anglo's were in Loyola. But MCC did have one Anglo-Indian professor who isn't forgotten. It was another legendary ca character, Robert Burns, who became a professor at your alma mater. MCC and um, well I never had the privilege of uh, uh, studying under him uh, I do remember uh, uh, googling him a couple of years ago and uh, finding a, f a couple of blogs that uh, just uh, sung his praises to the high heavens so your daughter studies Simon no no now she's taking French she's in the press too now she's taking French and she's doing pretty well she's a first comer in class so without tuition and all that Really, nowadays children are really very brilliant, very smart. Indeed, this is something to be proud of. But is the younger generation missing something? That time, the Anglo Indians were so different. They were so family oriented, and uh, you know, uh, even though we're coming from different backgrounds, all the Anglo Indians we used to get together, we used to have good fun. Touch me, touch me. like that children are so wanting to lead their own you know private lives they don't want to mingle along with the anglo Indians, and yes. there's so much of ego between children you know they don't like to mix nowadays that's the difference between the olden days and the younger days now there's no beating of the kids when they are young they will not grow up to be better kids very simple i went to australia i had two kids i gave them what they had to get at an age 
I didn't uh, put them down or I didn't put them up or I didn't let them go because they did something wrong. If they needed to get the cane, they got the cane. And I was prepared to go to the police or go to anyone and I would tell them why I did it. Uh, but what do your f children feel about that nowadays when they look back at it? Oh, they, they really, my, my daughter is always saying that because of daddy bring me up like the way I am, I am today what I am. But why are you strict with your children, Mr. Scarlett? Very, 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 very harsh for that. And do they, today, do they appreciate you for it? Yeah, they do. Especially my big girl. No, no. And the boys? I was, and the boys? No, I, you know, I, was a bit, I used to use my hands too much. It's no I regret, you know. Nobody wants to play anymore. Everybody wants to be adapted to smartphones and they prefer, you know, sitting in some gaming com console rather than actually being in the outdoors and experiencing what it is to have a sweat out or, you know, it's something strange that I, I don't see in children these days. Children don't have the capacity to even run a distance and then they're always panting. It's because they do not have, you know, they do not have, uh, you know, they don't have the stamina in them. It's because they're not given the opportunity to go out. For her part, Kristin has brought up her boys like a tiger mom. They would always be on the cycle, it would be in the, in the ground. It's because I never got them confined to cable TV. People always ask me, how do you even manage having three children who do not watch cable TV? I said, no, because I never even wanted to pay for it in the first place. Naomi is pretty, I mean, very Anglo, more Anglo than me, I would say in certain things. But uh, the kids too are pretty much... Uh, uh, picking up our style of, of life and uh, you know they love to dance and love to play and love to be outdoors more than indoors and uh. nowadays it is more concentration on the cell phones no talking no talking when you come home there's no talking it's all the cell phone one in the ears all your others both the ears are blocked up and they are concentrated <laughs> when we talk they don't answer <laughs> We miss all that conversation, no? The older generation, I mean, the style of what they lived is actually good. I wish we to practice that. What would you like to become? I wanted to get into this uh, management. I'm doing my BCom. Then further, I thought of doing my MBA and lawyer, and then look out for a job. We, we were the golden generation. Why? Because they were, they were just different, they were, they were a class of their own, they were different. We just, we are trying to emulate, we are trying to imitate, but we fall short.